we're going to use Feynman's technique to evaluate this integral. And that's a personal favorite of mine, as regular viewers of the channel know. So we're going to call this integral i for reference purposes. And the whole deal here is to define an integral function i of some parameter t by inserting this parameter somewhere within the integral structure. And a very natural choice here would be to insert the parameter as part of the argument of the sine function. So you get sine tx by x. And this isn't going to work. Why is that so? Well, Feynman's trick is based on differentiating the integral function. So if you differentiate this integrand partially with respect to the parameter t, and because we're differentiating partially with respect to t, all the x terms are just constants. So you have this 1 by x times the derivative of the sine function is a cosine function. So you have cosine tx and, wait, uh, much better. And because of the chain rule, you're going to get an extra factor of x here, a constant x in the t world, that is. And this cancels out quite nicely with the x term in the denominator. But now you're left with something not so useful. So according to this choice for the parameter, the derivative of i with respect to t equals the integral from negative to positive infinity of the cosine of tx dx. And this integral diverges. It doesn't exist. So we're going to have to use a different approach here. The cool thing here is we can get creative with the integral function. And we can define a parameterization in terms of t that gives you a convergent structure both for i of t and its derivative. And one thing to note here is that your integrand, that is sine x by x, is an even function of x because if you replace x by negative x, then because the sine function is an odd function, you can pop out this negative sine and you get negative sine x by x by negative x and the negative signs cancel out quite nicely to give you sine x by x, which is the original integrand. So yeah, you're integrating an even function over the real line. So instead of integrating from negative to positive infinity, we could just integrate from 0 to infinity and double the result. So we're going to define our integral function here, i of t, in terms of the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x dx. And we can define this integral function as that from 0 to infinity of sine x by x times some function of both the parameter t and the variable x. And we have to figure out which structure for the function will work. Now the available structures are polynomials, triggy functions, loggy functions, and exponential functions. And the best possible choice here would be an exponential function, specifically a damped exponential function, that is e to the negative tx, where it's now at the right time to define the parameter t as being non-negative. So yeah, this is cool. For a non-negative t and x on the right half of the real line, that is our interval of integration, the structure for i of t defined by sine x by x times e to the negative tx dx gives you no problems regarding convergence or boundedness because you have this damping factor here and sine x is a bounded function and 1 by x is a decreasing function on this interval. So yeah, there are no problems regarding convergence or boundedness anymore. And you won't have any problems even after differentiation as I'm about to demonstrate. So we're going to differentiate i with respect to the uh, parameter t. And because there are no problems regarding convergence or boundedness, we can perform the switch up of the integration and the differentiation operators. So you now have the integral from 0 to infinity. And because of the switch up, the total derivative is converted into a partial derivative with respect to t. So you're differentiating partially with respect to t, e to the negative tx times sine x divided by x dx. And on differentiation, uh, because we're holding the x variables constant for differentiation purposes, the sine x by x is a constant, 
and the derivative of e to the negative tx is e to the negative tx, and because of the chain rule, you have this factor of negative x as well, which cancelled out nicely with the x in the denominator. So you're left with the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative tx times sine x dx. The derivative of i with respect to t is well behaved, and by well behaved, I mean... Uh, wait a minute, I nearly forgot this negative sign here, so yeah. The derivative of i with respect to t equals the negative of the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x, which is a bounded function, times e to the negative tx, which is a decreasing function on this interval. So you have a bounded function times an, times a decreasing function. And by Dirichlet's convergence theorem, if you have the integral of a bounded function times a decreasing function, the integral converges. So that means the derivative of i with respect to t converges, which is perfect, and we can proceed with our solution development, which is pretty nice because sine x can be written as the imaginary part of e to the i x using order's wonderful formula. So we have the derivative of i with respect to t being equal to the negative of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative t x times e to the i x dx, and we need its imaginary part, that is. So this means we have the negative of the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity. On multiplying the two exponentials, you get e to the negative x times t minus i. Okay, cool. And on integration, you have the negative of the imaginary part of e to the negative x times t minus i divided by negative t minus i. So these two negatives cancel out quite nicely. And the limits are, of course, 0 and infinity. Now, let me just expand this term in the numerator for some more clarity. We have e to the negative xt times e to the i x. Now, the complex exponential function is an oscillatory function, so it doesn't bother us in the limit as x goes to infinity. However, in this limit, e to the negative tx approaches zero, so the entire thing collapses to zero. And in the limit as uh, x approaches zero, you have e to the zero times e to the zero, which is one. So you're left with the imaginary part of negative one divided by t minus i. And all we have to do now is separate this complex number into real and imaginary parts. And we can do so by expanding using the conjugate. So we're going to multiply and divide by t plus i. So this gives you the negative of the imaginary part of t plus i divided by t squared minus i squared. And i squared is, of course, negative 1. So you have t squared plus i down here. And you're left with the... Uh, uh, wait a second. Yeah, you're left with the negative of the imaginary part of this stuff, which is, of course, negative 1 by t squared plus 1. Okay, cool. So that is the structure for the derivative of i with respect to t, completely in terms of the variable t. And now we can recover our integral function i of t. We just have to integrate this with respect to t. And on the left-hand side, we have i of t again. And on the right, we have the negative of the inverse tangent of t plus a constant of integration c. And now to, to uh, determine this constant, we have to recall the structure of our integral function. That was the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative tx times sine x by x uh, dx. And... We need some information about the behavior of this integral function at some value or limit of t. And one useful piece of information is in the limit as t approaches infinity, i of t approaches, well, e to the negative t x here will approach 0. So the entire structure collapses to 0. So this is a useful piece of information. And applying this limit, as t approaches infinity, you get a 0 on the left-hand side. And the inverse tangent of t in the limit as t approaches infinity is pi by 2. So you're left with negative pi by 2 plus c. So this implies that the constant of integration here equals pi by 2. 
So finally, you have the integral function i of t being equal to pi by 2 minus the inverse tangent of this parameter t. And what exactly were we interested in? We were interested in the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x dx, which is just a case of your integral function i of t with t being equal to 0. So this implies that i being equal to i of 0 equals pi by 2 minus the inverse tangent of 0, which is 0. So you get i of 0 being equal to 0. And this implies that the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x dx equals pi by 2. So for the integral from negative to positive infinity, all we have to do is double the result. And the result is quite nicely equal to pi.